out of Wilmer, Whitmer, and she would, has requested to take some pictures after the service. So if you see a woman snapping photographs of you, it's for um, her collection. She's a, a, a photographer and has been with us this weekend, and so we're delighted to have her and her husband with us. This, this uh, afternoon, there will be a planning meeting for anyone who's interested in going to the Waldensian Valleys next summer, the summer of 2017. Um, the dates are still up in the air a little bit, and that's one of the reasons for meeting this afternoon. They'll be meeting at the museum at 4 p.m. Then this Wednesday night at 7 p.m., all men who are interested and occasionally enjoy singing, this is a, an occasion for you to enjoy it because we're inviting all the men to come forward uh, during the service next week and anyone who would like to assist in, in singing the anthem next Sunday. Uh, it will be a simple anthem to practice. We're going to practice at 7 o'clock Wednesday in the choir room. And then the rest of the choir, the women are in, encouraged to come about 7.30. The historical committee will meet Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. in the museum. Next uh, Sunday then is uh, Men of the Church Sunday and will be led in worship by a variety of fathers who are members of this church. And then um, at 8.30 next Saturday, in Pioneer Hall, the men of the church will have their breakfast and Bible study on um, men of the Bible. And um, I believe that's all I have as far as special announcements. I will say one more, is that next Sunday evening, uh, starting at 5.30 with dinner, till 5 to 6 o'clock, and then 6 to 8 next weekend, on Sunday through Wednesday, will be the time for our vacation Bible school. There, are, there is a track for children and youth, and there is a, a track for adults. And the adults will meet here. Um, we're going to be studying the book, the, Bible, the Exodus You Almost Passed Over, uh, which is a very fascinating and deeply insightful read to the book of Exodus. And so we'll be studying that, and uh, we encourage everyone who's interested to come and attend. We have a great number of uh, volunteers who are assisting with Vacation Bible School. We have 25 different individuals who are going to be involved with that. So we're delighted and look forward to seeing you next Sunday evening. Now let us prepare our hearts for the worship of God.
Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. And I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin.
Good morning. We've got more kids here than I expected with summer vacation beginning. And guess what? I am so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday we had to run to the airport and pick up one of my wife's relatives, and we got to go over to Ikea. Have you ever been to Ikea? Anybody in here ever been to Ikea? <laughs> if you're poor and you like modern stuff, Ikea is the place to be. So, yep, yeah, so I'm so excited because I got this awesome coffee cup. <laughs> what are you thinking? This is not the coffee cup. So you think it would be hard to drink coffee out of this? <laughs> Alright, I was kind of thinking the same thing actually. So, while I was there, I also grabbed this awesome coffee cup. It might take a while to get all my coffee out of this one. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking that too. So, I was like, maybe I should use this awesome coffee cup. Yeah. That's not a coffee cup. What do you think? This would hold coffee though, wouldn't it? I could, I could actually drink coffee out of this. Yeah, it would ruin my shirt. Ah, does that look like an Ikea coffee cup? Yeah. Yes, it does. And it is a very pleasing cup, I noticed. I grabbed it off the counter and I thought, wow, that thing's bounced just right. Whenever I lifted it up, I was like, wow, that's very comfortable. And it didn't spill all over me. This is a perfect coffee cup, isn't it? Perfect tool. Very pleasing. Do you know that you are like a coffee cup? Do you know that? To God, you're like a coffee cup. Yeah. God looks at you and God is like, I am very pleased with you. And what does God want to pour into you? I want to pour coffee into this cup. What does God want to pour into you? What? Love. Love. That's exactly right. His spirit. He wants to pour that into you. And you hold it, right? You hold it. You hold God's love. And guess what God wants you to do? God wants you to go out into the world and share that love. Always remember this. You are a perfect tool for God. You are perfect in every way. God wants to pour His love and His Spirit into you and bless the world. And guess what? Today, we are going to have some folks come up who are, who are basically going to be saying, here's my cup, Lord, fill it up. Right? We have a few folks who are going to be joining, and we even have one who's going to be baptized, prepared to accept God's Spirit and love and carry it out into the world. And you guys stay up. We're going to see this happen. So you guys stay up here. We're going to pray. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for these children. We thank you for all that they represent, all the potential that's here. We ask that you would bless their hearts and minds even now to know that they are, are completely uh, available, to know that they are completely perfect in every way when it comes to your plans and your desires for their lives. We ask that these folks join in. And, and these compromands and baptism and all of this would open our hearts and our minds to your love and to your presence. So that we can go out full of joy and complete your work. Amen. Alright, so let's move over to the side here. And our folks are going to come up. Your introduction about the perfect coffee cup was very fitting because somehow after the last wedding we did we lost our our little tub in here our little, little uh, basin so i had to go upstairs and get a basin that doesn't fit so we're in search of a perfect basin but i would like to invite elijah moore and his family forward at this time please this spring well eli is coming forward this spring we've had the opportunity to receive um, and to work with a couple of young boys who have gone to confirmation class jason and i have met with them numerous times over the last couple of months several months and um, eli is coming to us who's not been baptized yet so we're starting with him and then we'll invite uh, the other two individuals who are joining the church to come forward at that time, including 
Joseph Heilman, who was the second complement in that class. So in baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptisms as we celebrate the second. And here to present Eli is Elder John Lavery. John Eli, I ask you to affirm your faith by responding to these questions. Do you renounce all evil and powers in the world which defy God's righteousness and love? If so, please say, I do. Do you renounce the ways of sin that separate you from the love of God? If so, please say, I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior? If so, please say, I do. And... As a confirmed member of the body of this church, do you desire to enter into this church and become an active member here? John? And to the congregation, and you, the members of the congregation representing the church of Jesus Christ, promise to God to nurture this young man who stands before you this day by word of deed and love and prayer, encouraging him to follow Jesus Christ and to be faithful members of this church. Pray. Eternally gracious God, in countless ways you've revealed yourself to us in ages past and have blessed us with signs of your grace. We praise you that through the waters of the sea you led your people Israel out of bondage into freedom in the land of your promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your Son, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. Pour out your spirit now upon us and upon this water, that this font may be your place of new birth. May all who now pass through these waters be delivered from death to life, from bondage to freedom, from sin to righteousness. Bind them to the household of faith, guarding them from all evil. Strengthen them to serve you with joy until the day you make all things new. In Christ's name, amen. Elijah James Moore, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And I pray God's blessing and God's Spirit will fill your life and give you direction and purpose in all your life. Eli has now been sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever as a symbol of our welcoming love. We welcome you into this community of faith. And we also are grateful that his grandparents are here and his brother Dan. So if you guys will stand over to the side over here, I'll ask the other new members to come forward. Father Donato and yes. And Joseph Allen. Joseph is coming with his parents. Since you have already answered these questions, you won't have to do it again. <laughs> Hear the words from Peter's first letter to the church. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of the one who called you out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Sisters and brothers in Christ, our baptism is a sign and seal of our being cleansed from sin and of being grafted into Christ. Through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ, the power of sin was broken, and God's kingdom entered into our world. Through our baptism, we were made citizens of God's kingdom and freed from the bondage of sin. We now celebrate that freedom and redemption through the renewal of promises which you made at your baptism. John, would you introduce our newest members? Somebody to help her with this, and 
She grew up in a Methodist church, but she's joining us by reaffirmation of faith. There are some other individuals who were planning to be here, but are unable to because of work requirements and things, so uh, we will be receiving new members at a later time with them. But to those of you who are here, do you both turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior? So please say, I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love to your life's end? And so please say, I will with God's help. And do you renounce the ways of sin that separate you from the love of God? And so please say, I do. And then now, Eli, I want you to answer this question with the other two as well. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, sharing its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, fulfilling your call to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will with God's help. And with that, we have questions for the congregation. John? Yes. Um, as for do you, the members of the congregation representing the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to nurture and guide these other two people who are joining the church today, who stand before you today, by word of deed, love, and prayer, encouraging them to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of this church? If so, please say we do. Thank you. <laughs> And with that, we welcome these newest members, and we offer a prayer together. Let us pray. Holy God, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people, for gathering us into the body of Christ. We thank you for choosing to add to our numbers these brothers and sisters in faith. Together may we live in your spirit, and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom we give honor and glory forever. Amen. And now, as a sign of welcoming, we invite you to sing the first stanza, Bless Be the Kayak That Binds.
concerns that I'm aware of, and then ask you to share any that you have that I'm unaware of. First, Linda Braswell has been ICU at Grace Hospital, except to see me. Um, so we keep her in our prayers. This is now the third time this year, and I think uh, they'll be doing something different medically for her. Brenda Zimmerman also experienced the death of her father last week, Mr. Chapman, and we keep Brenda in our prayers. And then the family of Elizabeth Hinson, the aunt of Jim Furr, uh, died on Thursday morning after a long battle with Alzheimer's. And so we keep Jim and his family in our prayers. And uh, remembering others who are working through their grief. Are there other <coughs> prayer concerns that you all would really want to know of that we should look to God? Yes. Yes, what a wonderful time to graduate, but also a time of increased risk, especially uh, going to the beach with others. So keep the graduates uh, in your prayers. <coughs> the others. Yes. Let's turn to God in prayer. This morning, O oh God, as we celebrate new members joining our church and compromise which have made the faith in Jesus Christ their own personal faith, we lift them with gratitude for your expanding love, which teaches us to be open and to welcome in new people into our midst. We thank you for the welcoming nature of this congregation that made a big difference for Barbara as she joined this church. And we thank you for your blessing of love to guide all people who are seeking Christ and seeking to be connected with Christ's people to us that we might grow together in the faith. Help us, Lord, as we confront the challenges of life, especially grief. We pray your blessing upon Brenda and upon all who work through grief, as well as Jim Furr. We pray, Lord, for those whose health is very tenuous and in a difficult and critical state, for Linda Braswell and Rose Crouch. 
We pray your blessing on Gail Burles and ask your healing. Be with these people, O oh God, and help them to know the power of your love remains with them, whether their bodies heal or not. But we pray for their complete healing as you have called us to live as people of hope. We recognize, O oh God, evil and its presence in this world in very destructive and very disruptive ways to human life, like the shooter last night in Orlando, Florida, and the other one who in Orlando killed a young shooter just yesterday. We ask of God that your love and healing strength will bring about the renewal that you promised in this world, where there will be peace and there will be justice in this world as you would have it be. And we know how far we are from that truth, as we see violence throughout this world in many forms. Guide us, God, as your covenant people who serve as a witness to the life of Christ and who ourselves seem to be guided by that truth in all that we do, so that our witness will reflect the power of healing and peace and forgiveness in this world. We pray your blessing upon each member of this church and our guests and visitors this day, that as we go forward from here into this world, we may continue to serve as a light shining in the darkness, as Waldensians have been for 850 years. So guide us forward, for we offer this prayer in the name of the one who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
From Luke 7, 36 through the 8th chapter, verse 3. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet weeping and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who was touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who had canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say amongst themselves, Who is this that even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterwards he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as were some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmity. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their own resources. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it hasn't been too many months since I preached on the story about Mary, the sister of Martha and Jesus, and her taking a jar of costly ointment. Some of you may remember that. That was just about four months ago. And that was in preparation for the burial of Jesus. That passage has similarities to the text that we used this morning in featuring the use of costly ointment by a woman poured on the feet of Jesus. However, this story this morning is a perfect example of how a similar can, event can be taken by a different gospel writer for a different purpose. Instead of the gospel, John's focus on a gift of gratitude given to Jesus during a meal at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, thanking Jesus for resurrecting Lazarus from the dead. Here in our text this morning from Luke, the woman with the jar of costly perfumed oil is unknown. The house where the meal occurs does not belong to his free, three friends, but belongs to a Pharisee named Simon. So let's begin by concentrating our focus on the text so that we can gain deeper insight into what Jesus wants us to learn. This is a story grounded in the sin of a woman and the judgmental attitude of a religious leader. But more importantly, it's a story about grace and forgiveness and grace's ability to give us new life. 
The text contrasts between the differences of this woman and her response to Jesus and this man who is bound by rigid self-discipline, who doesn't even see himself as a sinner. It also points out the difference between sins that are acted out of a person's life and a sinful state of being judgmental of other people. This story communicates there are two different kinds of sin. Whenever we Presbyterians are in a mixed crowd or have folks that come to our church that are not Presbyterian, usually for a wedding or a funeral, and we say the Lord's Prayer, there are people who include the phrase, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, which takes an awful lot longer to say than forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Well, when that happens in this church, we know what happened because it takes them a while to get caught up with us. You know, have you ever stopped to ask why we say debts and others say trespasses and still others say sins? Now, somebody with a stilted sense of humor explained it this way. You know those Presbyterians. Because they're going to ask for forgiveness of their debts they're all about money, those folks. They're more interested in having their debts forgiven than having a right relationship with God. And you know those Episcopalians who say trespasses, they're more interested in having people keep off their property because they're the landowners. Now we laugh because we know that's not what this means. Don't buy into that kind of reasoning hear that argument. The Gospel of Matthew uses the terms debts the way that Jesus teaches his disciples the Lord's Prayer, and the book of Luke uses the term trespasser, so both are there. What's the difference? Essentially, there are two types of sin. We call them sins of omission and sins of commission. A sin of omission for example, as a person who has been made clearly aware of the needs of a neighbor who's had their house burned down. Oh yes, I'm going to go and take care of that person and do something nice for them tonight, no, maybe tomorrow, and yet they never get around to it. And so that would be a sin of omission, something you failed to do that you were convicted to do in your heart, but you didn't follow through. <coughs> Sins of commission are sins that we commit. They are wrongdoings that one willfully engages in, such as theft, willful destruction of property, or physical assault on another human being. Both kinds of sins are at work in this gospel story. Although we're not told what the sins of the woman are, she is publicly acknowledged as being a sinner and is clearly remorseful about her sins. In response, she brings to the home of Simon the Pharisee a costly jar of ointment to anoint Jesus, who she's heard about as one who forgives sinners. And when she can't pour it on his head, as would have been the custom, she first washes his feet with her tears, and then takes out the oil and rubs it into his feet. This unnamed woman represents sins of commission. But the other character in the story besides Jesus is a Pharisee named Simon. And rather than extend to Jesus the common Middle Eastern courtesy of hospitality, which was expressed by welcoming a person with water at the door so they could wash the dust off their feet as they entered the house also to give a kiss of welcome on the side of the cheek and to anoint that person's head with oil. These were everyday common courtesies for someone coming to a person's house who's been invited to dinner and Simon doesn't do a one of them. Sins of omission. What he failed to do. Isn't it ironic to note that we're not told the nature of the specific sins of the woman? Commentators down through the ages have assumed that her sin had been prostitution or some other kind of sexual promiscuity. 
but it could very well have been another kind of sin. The important thing is it was sin, and she acknowledged it, and the public community acknowledged whatever she did is wrong. And so she was very transparent, if you will, in acknowledging her need for forgiveness. Simon the Pharisee on the other side, we see in him a sin, a sin of not doing something for Jesus, but also a sin of being very con condemning and critical judgmental towards this woman who happens to come into his house, judging her to be inferior. Both she and he are sinners. And we, the audience of the story, can recognize that we've committed both kinds of sins in our lives. There is a message in this story for all of us, whether we are the most upstanding Christian living in Western North Carolina, we are all sinners in need of grace. It could be argued that the greater sin in this story comes from Simon the Pharisee, because he is blind to his own sin doesn't even recognize his need for forgiveness. He's so blind to his own sinfulness that he's not even open to receiving God's grace. Well, let's go a bit deeper because there's something else at work in this text. By judging this woman as being a dirty sinner, Simon the Pharisee engages in the common practice of shaming. We've all heard of shunning which is a form of shaming. Shunning in churches often happens when someone has done something wrong and no one will acknowledge their presence in the church. I don't think that's happened here. I hope not. But shaming is something we're all very familiar with. We see it on the preschool, at preschool level when one child is laughed at by others and made to feel ashamed for what they did or what they said. We see it all the way through life. Shaming is a powerful force at work in human life. The woman had already been branded by the community as being a sinner. She had been pushed to the fringes of her society long enough to make her feel like a complete outsider. Someone who was ostracized and rejected. And when she comes to the house of Simon uninvited, she comes with the intention of anointing Jesus with the contents of an alabaster jar of ointment. And she's crying as she prepares to apply the ointment on Jesus' feet. So let's stop and ask the question, why is this woman weeping? Stop for a moment and think about types of situations that cause you to tear up. Grief certainly causes tears. But so can a sense of one's guilt and wrong result in tears of remorse. We sometimes cry when we realize we've caused pain or suffering to someone innocent, especially if it's our own child. We know that kind of tear. We also cry at times when we've been released from a great burden of guilt. And we know those tears to be healing tears. And sometimes we cry when we experience in our lives a great sense of restoration, of spiritual and emotional wholeness, and those are tears of joy. And I have experienced all of them. And as human beings, I'm sure all of you have as well. Within the context of this story, this unnamed woman shows up to anoint the feet of Jesus, and she does it out of her reverence and respect, and I believe out of her desire to be restored as a right relationship with God. She recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. The tears she cries may very well be a combination of both remorse and release because she has been freed from the power of sin to destroy her life. This would be the motivation behind her continually kissing and wiping Jesus' feet. 
The Gospel writer gives us very little time to focus, though, on this woman's response because immediately we're focusing on the response of Simon the Pharisee. What kind of prophet is this who forgives this woman? If he had known that she was a sinner, he would have known and been a prophet of God. But he's no prophet of God. Uh -uh. Any respected Jewish leader would not allow himself to be rendered unclean by this unclean woman. Now, if you hear judgment dripping off of those words, that's exactly what Simon was intending. And with an air of disdain, he publicly ridicules this woman for being present at his dinner party, raising the level of shame she already felt for the past sins committed. Personal shame. It can come in two different forms, internally creating an awareness of separation, not only between us and our neighbors, but us and God. Or it can be external, shame that is put upon us by outsiders, by friends, even by family members. But shame can also be externally applied when we are made to feel small and insignificant and put down. Now, shame has its positive side in that it can help us to know when we cross the line of appropriate behavior that we'll never do it again. But there is a very fine line between a healthy understanding of shame in our lives and the shame that destroys and damages. In its worst form, shame can debilitate and isolate a person into a state of total alienation with one's neighbors and one's true self and one's with God. Shame makes us want to hide. We hide in addictions, a bottle, or painkillers. We hide by avoiding other people and failing to make eye contact with them. Psychologists say that people that are so filled with shame, their shoulders turn inward and they look down and they will never make eye contact with people because they are so, so broken by this thing called shame. Our passage communicates the woman has carried around that burden of shame for a long time and finally she gets a chance to release it. She encounters the Messiah. The emotional outpouring of tears reflects just how powerful the release is for her and as she attends to Jesus. But Simon the Pharisee tries to keep her bound by her shame, keep her focused on her unacceptable behavior by emphasizing the strict obedience to the law and the purity code. Anyone who did not comply with either the law or the purity code in ancient Israel was subject to rejection and ridicule, which coercively forced them back to accept obedience to the letter of the law as being the basis of a right, right relationship with God. But what Jesus does in this text is to demonstrate that a relationship with God is discovered through God's forgiveness not through our perfection. And yet we berate and beat ourselves for not remaining perfect 100% of the time. The very religious structure which pushes people to be perfect actually feeds their shame because they fall short, just as we all do. We all do. By imposing shame on this woman, the Pharisee is blind as to how his whole orientation to God and his fellow human beings actually separates himself from both. The, best, the very last thing that this unnamed woman in the story seeks is to find herself at the center of attention. Imagine the courage it took for her to walk into the center of ridicule and shame to express her love and gratitude to Jesus. She already knows the power of his love and acceptance, 
and with his response to her, she experiences an overwhelming sense of gratitude and release. And he dismisses her with a freedom she had not known. Go in peace, he says, for your sins are forgiven. And Jesus' response does more than simply accept her for who she is. His response lifts a burden of shame from her life, giving her a sense of value and self-worth. Don't we all need to be reminded of that in our own lives? So what would it take to free you from your shame? Give it over. Not to me, but to Christ. And let him wash you with his love. This kind of forgiveness is available to each and every one of us, allowing us to be released from shame, that which we try to cover ourselves with so as not to be seen. Being free from shame allows us to accept restored restoration within our relationships when they've been impacted by that shame. A heart bound by sin and shame withers and dies, but the love of our forgiving God lifts us to heights of inner wholeness and causes us to sing with deep gratitude. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. I'm free at last. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us stand and affirm our faith in the redeeming love of Christ as we share together Colossians 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things are created. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to that first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Amen. Please be seated. As we respond to God, we do so in gratitude and thanksgiving through our offerings and our gifts of love. <laughs>
So use these gifts and use our lives for that purpose. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.